When people are presenting, we're going to turn the camera off. That's what they asked us to do. But then when the panel's talking. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second Marine <laughs> webinar held in collaboration with Possible Events. Today, we're looking at the container shipping industry and trying to make some sense of the stats. My name's Bill Lyons, and I'm your moderator for today's session. I'm delighted to welcome our international panel. Uh, there's a group of experts who are going to be giving their perspective on what's happening both on the ground and at sea at the moment. Um, but before I do the intros, uh, I just wanted to show you a little screenshot from Marine Traffic. Uh, this shows you all the world's container ships as of, I think, last night. Um, these are all, it's all about ships moving goods, manufactured goods, fruit and vegetables, PPE, medicines. Um, some of these ships will be full, some will be empty. Some will be laid up and idling, some will be loading. Um, but it's about a global liner network, which is keeping economies connected and supply chains moving. Um, and without it, we shouldn't forget the world would be a very, very different place. Um, but it's also very easy to forget that these dots on the screen are actually, there are people on them. There are seafarers on board these ships. And lots of these guys, lots of these seafarers should actually be at home with their families uh, after months and months at sea. Um, but the COVID-19 travel restrictions has meant that many haven't been relieved at what should have been the end of their tour. So we will be discussing a little bit about what this could mean for trade if this issue isn't resolved soon. But let me introduce you to our, to our panelists. Um, we have Lorianne LaRocco. Um, she's an editor with CNBC Business News and also someone who seems to be absolutely fascinated by global shipping and what it tells us about global trade policies. Her most recent book, uh, Trade War, Containers Don't Lie, Navigating the Bluster, it looks at some, the impact that US trade policies and tariffs have had on container movements. I'm hoping that, Laurie, you'll be able to uh, give us some perspectives into what changing trade patterns and flows mean for the US economy, for the international economy, and what's really happening on the ground at the moment, and give us some actionable insights. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jan Hoffman who is chief of UNCTAD's trade logistics branch. For those of you who don't know UNCTAD, it's the Geneva-based United Nations organization that helps keeps the world connected. Um, it supports countries across the global economy through technical assistance and analysis. Dr. Hoffman has worked for UNCTAD for, I think, for over 17 years, and he's a highly respected analyst. We're also pleased to introduce uh, Jean Soroka, who is the executive director at the Port of Los Angeles, uh, which is one of the US, uh, US's key ports and the gateway for international trade. As well as handling dry bulk, tankers, railroad cruise ships, it's actually America's busiest container port and last year moved over 9 million TEU. Before his appointment at Los Angeles, Jean spent many years with APL, American President Lines, um, a large ocean carrier. And today he runs one of the world's busiest ports and his new role uh, is also Chief Logistics Officer for Los Angeles. This was a position that was created this March by the mayor, I think, as part of the city's reaction to COVID-19. Um, so again, he'll be able to give us a unique perspective on what's happening on the ground at the moment. And I'm really looking forward to hearing his current take on, on what's happening. We also have Lars Ostergaard Nielsen, who's joining us from Panama. Uh, where he's Merck's regional CEO for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, he spent his whole career with Merck since he joined the company in the early 1990s. Um, this career has taken him all around the world. He's had stints in Sri Lanka, Philippines, UAE, Shanghai, Istanbul, to name but a few. But he'll be giving us the perspective of a company which shifts around 12 million plus containers a year. So it'll be very, very interesting to hear what he has to say. And last but not least, uh, Judah Levine, who's the research lead at Freytos, and he's joining us from Israel. Uh, Freytos is a freight marketplace used by retailers and manufacturers to get air, ocean, and trucking rate quotes. So again, I think his student's gonna have a pretty unique perspective on the impact the crisis is having on container shipping. He's an experienced market researcher, and he has a PhD from the University of Chicago. But it's not just about the experts, it's about you, the audience as well. So please do use the chat, chat function. Uh, if you look on the right of the screen, I think you'll see a chat function. Um, those messages will come into to the moderator so we can try and select a few of them. I can't promise we'll answer all of them. There are quite a few of you on this, on this call. Um, but 
if you don't get a chance to um, you know see everything, catch everything people are saying, we will be sending a, a link round at, at the end of this so you can watch the session again. But to set the scene, uh, let me hand over to, to Jan Hoffman, who's going to talk us through the latest global trade stats. Jan. Jan, you're going to need to switch your audio on. Sorry, I was... I, welcome, thank you so much. Uh, very happy to be here. I just clicked on next slide. And I will also switch off my um, my uh, camera, so I'm not hiding the source's information. Um, yeah, three, four slides to, to set the scene. Some of you may have seen this slide already last week when my UNCTAD colleague, uh, Jan Chun, spoke about commodities. So that's an UNCTAD forecast slash nowcast of how bad it is, really. That's the trade contraction uh, based on data. Now, what data is this based on? Uh, some of this data is actually shipping data because trade and GDP and economic data is not yet available. Uh, statistics always come with a certain delay. So what do we do to get the best picture of, of what is the economy and trade looking like? Among other things, like uh, in Laurie's book, Containers.lie, so um, we look at speed of ships, or we look at uh, how many ships arrive and leave, um, and do this type of nowcast. And what I'm sharing here, it's really uh, under construction. I just the first picture here shows how the forecast changes every week. That's the main message. Then the below, when we want to forecast future maritime trade, which many in the audience are interested in, you want to know what will be the seaborne trade demand by commodity, by oil, dry, by containers next year and in two years, then we again use, try to look at elasticity. So we forecast GDP. So it's a bit a circular thing. I just wanted to share this, the linkage, because the, the this webinar is about forecasts. <clears throat> it's difficult. That's the main message here. But whatever we can do, I shared. But I also told you, uh, be careful, but don't, these forecasts change every week. Um, so what what is the current data? And, and here I'm sharing with you, uh, like in the time series, the map that you, Bill, showed us earlier. Uh, you see four main vessel types. The biggest, thickest one I've put in red because that's our topic today. It's containers. And the thin straight red line is where we were last year at the same time. So con all segments are below last year. Passengers are worst. Uh, blue, the oil has also gone down, and containers are relatively not quite as bad. And if you want to see how this one looks like in your country, um, I will now have to ask um, Bill to share screen for the video that we had prepared. Right. So there is... Um, you should now be seeing a moving map, and we are quite proud of this map. So this is Marine Traffic Data, AIS. And you can see three things in one single map. You see first the relative size of a country's bubble circle is how many container ships arrive every week. Then you see how it is going less, it's growing, going up, going down. And thirdly, you see by the color whether it is more or less than last year. And you may recall, and, and afterwards you can play this movie several times. Uh, that's really up to last week. Uh, yeah, there we are over with it. You see most countries started in green and then most uh, countries ended in red and China is already back in green. So this was this uh, map per country with this chart. One last uh, chart I wanted to share. This is now the fleet deployment, the schedules. I've taken, uh, this is from MDS Transmodal, I've taken the, uh, the leading economies from different regions. Most uh, were still good in the first quarter and are now down in the second quarter. Um, and yeah, even those that are positive, there's for most of them a lower growth in the second quarter. So this is what we had discussed and agreed with Bill and the colleagues to set the scene, to set the linkage. We want to forecast. It's about the future. Containers don't lie. They tell us something about the future. But then the container carriers themselves would like to know hmm, what will be their, their future. So we start with today's data and 
do some now cast and forecast, and that's the latest picture here. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jan. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, Judah, um, who is going to look at what the carrier's response has been to this drop-off on trade and, and how it's impacted on, on freight rates. Judah. Thank you. Um, so as, as Jan said, um, uh, the topic is to understand where we're going. Um, but my job for the, for the next few minutes is to kind of present what's been the impact uh, of the pandemic on um, uh, on containerized freight so far, so we can try and uh, extrapolate where things uh, might be going or what trends are, are driving each of these, uh, uh, the data that we're seeing now. Uh, Bill, I don't seem to be able to, there we go, thank you. Um, so the story of COVID-19's impact on, on freight and logistics is really a, a story of swings, uh, disruptions um, in supply and demand. So this graph is from our Freitos Baltic Index, the FBX, which is an index of containerized ocean freight uh, spot rates. And the, the graph we're looking at is the example for the price to ship a, a 40 foot container from uh, China or Asia to the US West Coast since the start of the year. Though um, Asia, Europe lanes behaved in, in a similar way to this, to this chart we're seeing. So generally we look at ocean rates for uh, a good reflection of the demand for goods out of China. Um, and as we'll see in the current climate, uh, it can also represent the supply side uh, of ocean logistics or the level of ocean capacity that's available on the market that uh, Jan actually touched on. Um, so we can see starting in January, container rates where prices increased, showing demand was high pre-Chinese New Year as importers generally rushed to get shipments out of China uh, before factories shut down for the holiday week. Um, then the outbreak and shutdown hit in China and we see that reflected in rates plateauing and then falling as China was, was shut down and manufacturing or the supply of goods was disrupted or put on pause um, through February. But once manufacturing in China picked up by mid-March, we see a, a spike in prices, which seemed like a big spike uh, at the time, 15% uh, in the last two weeks of March. Uh, and that showed that U.S. importers before COVID-19 had really uh, started impacting the U.S. directly um, were rushing to fulfill that pent up demand of orders that, that weren't able to get out of China during the, during the shutdown. But into uh, early April, as uh, COVID-19 increasingly shut down the U.S. economy, we see that spike slow and then level off. And this is because as the U.S. itself began being affected by the virus and shutting down, um, U.S. importers started canceling orders, not making new orders. Um, uh, uh, that are canceling orders that they had made during the uh, China's rebound um, as U.S. consumer demand was dropping uh, faster in the shutdown. So the expectation could have been that after that, with this global and U.S. consumer demand dropping, that ocean rates would drop as well if there was a lack of demand, um, that they might drop through, through uh, Q2. But instead, we can see that in April, rates pretty much stayed level. In May, prices even climbed a bit. They were even above that, that pre-Chinese New Year level. And so far in June, rates have really spiked. So more than 60% since the end of May, um, rates are even higher than they were in the fall of 2008 in the lead up to the introduction of, of uh, tariffs during the trade war. So this is all to say how remarkable really the, the situation is right now because uh, generally elevated or spiking rates reflect healthier surging demand for freight like we saw pre-trade war, or we see uh, before each uh, Chinese New Year, but we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we're in a low consumer demand environment, uh, but and ocean volumes have been hard hit as I'm sure we're gonna see. So, so the question is, what was the, what's going on here? If we could go to the next slide, please. Oh, no, I control it, thank you. Um, so the reason that we've seen these elevated level, these elevated and, and level prices, and now these spiking rates in June, is that as demand for Chinese imports dropped because of the shutdown in the US and, and Europe, um, ocean carriers began canceling or blanking a record number of sailings to reduce ocean freight capacity, match it with this low um, demand for freight um, in order to prevent losses uh, as much as possible by the carriers by cutting their costs and also preserve revenue by keeping ocean prices from collapsing. And these moves succeeded in keeping rates up and fairly stable in April and May, as we've, as we've seen. Um, but as there's been a, a generally unexpected bump uh, in demand since the start of this month, the start of June, uh, this increase in demand met this already very tight capacity to send rates really spiking. So um, how tight has capacity been? So if we look at the, uh, at, at the data on this slide, uh, again, looking at the Asia US lane, for, for example, in May, we see 47 out of 249 sailings were canceled. That reduced capacity by about 
um, and this resulted in quite full ships. So utilization was was good from what um from what we've seen. So we can infer that volumes in the month of May dropped about twenty percent year on year. Um, and for context, I think January through April overall was down eight uh, percent in terms of volumes year over year. And June, we can see also had a 15% reduction in capacity or a restriction of capacity through canceled sailings, which is significant. And when some of these volumes return unexpectedly or unexpectedly to carriers, uh, its effect was amplified and led to this, this spike that we've seen um, this month. But looking ahead, if we look at cancellations for July and August, we see at this point, and it's getting late uh, to announce blankings for, for the month of July, these cancellations have been pretty minimal. Only 26 blank sailings have been announced for the third quarter uh, for U.S. arrivals in July, uh, compared to um, 105 for through April, May, and June. Um, so, so this uh, uh, approach to not removing so much capacity is really kind of in contrast to the latest, for example, um, a National Retail Federation import forecast, which is forecasting a 17% drop year over year in imports uh, in July double digits in August and, and then only more of a rebound in September. So using blankings as a window uh, into the volumes carriers are expecting, uh, we see perhaps a more optimistic outlook for the coming months than some of the other estimates. Um, carriers could be seeing this spike in June as uh, uh, as the start of, a, of an extended rebound as a, economies are opening up in the US and elsewhere. Uh, we've even seen some carriers reinstating some um, sailings that were that were canceled, or it could also be carriers being more cautious about canceling too much too soon, as some of the Q2 um, cancellations were announced uh, fairly uh, far in advance, and trying to to uh, be more nimble in in meeting these changes in demand, so there wouldn't be as as big swings. Um, but this really points to, in my opinion, the overall sentiment in the industry right now, which is really uncertainty. Uh, if consumer behavior is uncertain. And businesses are uncertain when to order, and then carriers are uncertain about the level of, of capacity that needs to be in, in, in the market in order to manage their businesses. Um, and of course, aside from causing volatility in rates, as we've seen, um, this drop in trade also has significant knock-on effects on, on ports, on railroads, on trucking, and all the other parts of the supply chain uh, waiting to, to process these containers. Um, and this drop in volumes has, of course, already been uh, being felt, as I'm sure Gene is going is to detail for us. So. Um, so that's really kind of a, a roundup of what we've seen so far. Uh, what we can kind of extrapolate, uh, we'll, what direction this might put us in uh, moving forward, um, and see what it can tell us about freight and global trade at the moment. Thank you, Gina. So some interesting presentations there, some interesting numbers, but Lorianne, I wonder perhaps you could take a little look at the here and now. Um, what are your sources telling you at the moment? You very much someone with your ear to the ground in the US and, and further afield. Yes, yeah, so I, I was on the phone all this morning trying to get us the latest information. And from what I've been told by those on the ground here in the United States that work with uh, European distributors as well as Chinese, that they are still expecting Outflow of China, for example, down 15 to 25 percent in terms of uh, in terms of volume, and that the customers that normally order, say, three times a week, uh, 40 foot containers, they're now only ordering one or two, and that is a very good forward looking indicator, further further highlighting, if you will, the stress of the American consumer here. Um, I've also spoken with uh, other retailers, uh, the ones, the intermediary, intermediaries, who are telling me that as far as they're looking at back to school, it's much more um, essential products versus the non-essential products. And you really can see that change and the shift, if you will, of the consumption of the consumer and more importantly, the global consumer, as everybody can attest uh, around the world as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, that we are all looking at buying toilet paper, hand sanitizer, Lysol wipes. And as I always say in what I wrote in my book, you know, trade is agnostic and it's, it's pure, simple supply and demand. So you could take the rhetoric aside. And when you look at various trade lanes, particularly, um, if you will, the intra-Asia trade lane, that lane is very, very interesting because it shows you the semi-finished and the finished goods. And as you can see, the volume is, is, is down considerably. 
And that actually backs up what my folks are telling me on the ground as it relates to the orders that they are seeing at the manufacturers. Uh, for example, there's a wonderful website that actually tracks, it's a COVID-19 tracker that is showing you in real time or as close to real time as possible, which retailers are fulfilling their orders and more importantly, paying those orders. Um, and there you see it right there. You can see which brands have committed to pay in full. And then of course, uh, then you have a list of others that have not committed to pay full orders or they're not, or they don't want them. And why are they not paying for the orders? Why are they, why they don't want them? It's because they don't have a buyer. It's the, it's the consumer angle. So based on all this, and from what I'm hearing from my sources is that the contraction that we're seeing in containers based on consumption will continue uh, for the for at least you know the next uh, several months or so. you're muted. Thank you. I'll get the hang of this one, though. <laughs> um, really, for the panel, um, to what extent do we think that uh, existing trends are just being accelerated by COVID-19? I wonder, perhaps, if we could turn to the Port of LA. What, what, what's your take on what you've just heard? I agree with everything that's been said, and Lori Ann's uh, ear to the ground is very important because that's exactly what's happening in the marketplace today. Uh, here we have a unique perspective on the ground at the Western Hemisphere's largest container port in that we've had two bad shocks to the supply chain. One, the ill-advised tariff policies of our administration in Washington with respect to the China trade war. And then to add insult to injury has been the literal shuttering of the American economy in response to COVID-19. 70% of U.S. GDP is made up of us consumers, and that simply is not taking place today. But there are opportunities as America's economy attempts to reopen and reemerge. But just to set the stage and put this in perspective, as we began to peak in 2018 calendar year, as shown by the upcoming chart, we started to get hit by the section uh, by section tariffs that were implemented by the administration in Washington, and we began to feel the effects throughout 2019. Importers began to run up inventories ahead of tariff milestones, and these tariffs were put in place, were paid by no one else but American companies importing goods from China. As we continued to see the choppiness or uneven number of imports, it put a unique strain on our infrastructure system. At the same time these tariffs were being implemented, retaliatory tariffs were put in place by China, precipitating 14 consecutive months of export declines. Everything from agricultural to heavy duty manufacturing, including automotives and tiered suppliers, mainframe computer systems, and, and many other products. So what this trade policy did, quite simply in the United States, was increase imports, decrease exports and widen the trade gap with China. Not an outcome that many would have liked to see in Washington. Then on the heels of that, which we saw in the fourth quarter of 2019, volume at the Port of Los Angeles dropped by more than 16% as a direct result of the trade war. And now our outlook for the remainder of this year brings us back to pre-recession levels. And I'll remind the audience that here at the Port of Los Angeles, it took us a decade after the Great Recession to get our volume back to where it was pre-2008. Now, I'm not sure that the clairvoyant look at what this pandemic and the combination of the trade war are going to bring, but it will definitely be an uphill climb as our consumers slowly go back to the stores, we go out to our restaurants, and otherwise try to recapture buying patterns. And at the same time, we are discarding of dairy products. We are culling our livestock and perishable commodities are wilting on their vines, literally. 
So in an effort, we need to get folks back to work as quickly as we can. But that's going to take some some real look and vision. And what we've seen here as far as the people who work on our docks is that you have just about a corresponding decline in jobs as you do in cargo through the Port of Los Angeles. Year over year, our longshore labor or dock worker work shifts are down 19 percent. And compared to a more broad look of a three-year average, we're down 20%. Now, at a time when 40 million Americans are out of work because of these policies and the lack of a response to COVID-19, I'll take that for right now. We continue to move essential products and those critical to what we are trying to accomplish here in the United States. And we're mustering all effort to help reopen our farm communities manufacturing sector and our automotive business, among others. But this will have a lasting effect. And it's my view that here in the United States and specifically Los Angeles, because we have a high China content in our book of business, we will permanently lose 15% of our imports that come through this gateway. And combined with our neighboring port, we represent 40% of all imports to the world's largest economy. That being said, the rules are what they are, and we will have to reinvent ourselves. It's my belief that we need to implement a nationwide port community system because the United States, quite factually, is well behind Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And I know we have delegates on the phone from all those areas here today. We need to advance ourselves digitally so we can get containers, truck and rail service to those rural communities of agriculture and manufacturing quicker than we otherwise would do in a siloed effect. We also need to make sure that we are combining efforts to help bring the American worker back on the job as quickly as possible. But make no mistake, this will not be a V-shaped recovery in the United States. As an early indicator of the U.S. economy in the shipping market, we see the knock-on effects of both of these issues lasting at least through the end of this year and into 2021. Again, reminded by the fact that we have so many people out of work and not many of us are out there spending money in our economy. I have put together for the first time a West Coast coalition of business interests to help drive port business in the United States. It includes labor, employers, Western railroads, and others very important to this. But also another key statistic is the West Coast ports on the container side of our business in the United States account for 12% of US GDP. Their effect on downline improvement is absolutely critical. Now, the silver lining may be as imports go in different directions and away from the West Coast ports and specifically Southern California, we have an opportunity to focus and overinvest in the U.S. export market, as I mentioned. This may, in effect, give us a better balance of trade because today we face a balance of about five laden containers inbound to every two outbound. If we can extract that empty repositioning cost, land side and ocean, we may be able to do some things a little bit differently to lower our cost to serve and become a more attractive gateway for the logistics decision maker. But at the same time, because of our very strong financial policies, we'll continue our investment through cycle with nearly $400 million worth of projects, 3,000 construction jobs, and an eye on the digital economy and digitization of the supply chain, while others are looking towards uh, other areas of focus. And at the same time, if we can manufacture all of this improvement in our bricks and mortar infrastructure, as well as digital and process management, we hope to come out of the other end of COVID-19 and this trade war with a renewed sense of earning more cargo, which will mean more jobs, not only here in Southern California, but around the nation. Thank, thank you, Jim. Um, Lars, if I can bring you in on this. So what's what's your take on what you're hearing from, from a carrier's perspective? 
Yeah, well, I think let, let me start off with, with a word that has been mentioned quite a few times uh, so far, and that's uncertainty. Uh, th th that really is the, uh, the, the take we have on what's going on right now. It, it is really very, very difficult, uh, even for, for a carrier our size, to, to have a, a concrete uh, a certainty around what, what's going to happen um, in, in, in the months ahead. Um, as a good example, we, we had a, um, a statement with our first quarter earnings that we had expected um, an impact uh, likely to be in the 20-25% uh, range for, for volume. Um, we have actually suspended our full year guidance because we simply have so much uncertainty that we don't feel we can give an accurate view on, on what's ahead of us for, for 2020. Uh, but last week we actually um, gave an, an updated outlook for Q2, uh, where we are seeing volumes coming back uh, a little bit stronger than what we had uh, expected just a few months before. Uh, so, so we are now looking at a Q2 outlook where we see our volume uh, being a little bit better than, than expected. And I'm talking global uh, volumes here, um, that we are probably looking at a shortfall to the tune of, of around 18% rather than what we had feared would be 2025. Um, looking into to Q3 uh, and, uh, and 4, we, we simply still have so much uncertainty. We, we obviously, we service around... 15, 17 percent of the global uh, of the global market. So we obviously get a lot of feedback and input from from a large number of uh, of customers around the world, of course, including the US, but but also in the rest of the world. Um, and and again, no one is willing to give us too many firm forecasts, which also leads back to to some of the data that was shown from from Judah and and also from Jan in terms of number of of blank sailings, in terms of of impact on. Uh, on how we are managing our business. Um, so at, at this stage, I think what, what we can say is that, that, that things are certainly uncertain. Uh, what we can see that is more certain is, is also as, as what was shared uh, by Jean, uh, that there's a very clear drive towards uh, more e-commerce, more digital products. Uh, we see uh, that customers are looking for solutions that they were perhaps starting to uh, to use but but we've certainly seen that accelerating uh, during the last couple of months um, even when i look at our own company as a good example we have actually had periods uh, in the last uh, months where we have had as as many as 90 95 percent of our of our colleagues working from home um, so, so we have seen a very clear trend that, that we also need to be a lot more agile in how we run our own company uh, and that's very much reflected in what we see from from our client base uh, around the world as well Okay. Yeah. Jan, do you, what, what, what's your take on what you're hearing? Do, have these guys got it right? Do the stats match up to the rhetoric? Um, well, my main message was it's, it's really um, difficult and, uh, and uh, sometimes it's forecasting trade with data on shipping and then trying to forecast shipping with data on trade and the economy. Um, I, no, I think uh, or everything I've heard, I, I think is, is correct, including the uncertainty. What I think where we will all be on the same page is the certainty with which the what shipping needs to do and what ports need to do, which is to dematerialize processes. That's something we have been selling, the ideas we have been selling for decades. You need to automate pre-arrival processing, single windows, um, digitalize, uh, not to touch paper, not to, to have physical contacts. And all of a sudden, thanks in inverted commas to the, to the pandemic, uh, the transport workers and the customs officers and the dock workers, they all uh, are, are very much demanding our solutions, be it C-factor recommendations, be it customs automation, be it single windows, be it trade information portals. So that is something where we are all working on and we see a good coalition there and overall i must say the the shipping industry and the ports have reacted very very well it's, it's positive i think overall very few ports were closed for very few days uh shipping industry that could be a separate discussion and i know we had to, it's a potential for the remaining 25 minutes um that that shipping is actually making profit in in these difficult times and some shippers and some advocates and 
analyst, they say, hmm, this is an indicator that the oligopoly or the alliance or the, the capacity management works maybe better than some shippers would like it. On the other hand, I don't think any shipper would want another hanjin, would want another bankruptcy. So we are analyzing this from Anktad. We see overall that the sector as such, ports and shipping, have responded quite well, and we try to support it with our uh, with the different electronic tools we have. Of course, most of our work is in developing countries, but it's the same tools that Gene presented that others are, are using to digitalize. And I think that's that's then there where our sector, the shipping sector, independent of the uncertainty, how bad will it remain? How long will it remain bad? Whatever we can do that will, it will be a little less bad. Uh, I think we are working on this together. And I had a couple of other slides with some links, but we don't need to share these. They will be shared with the participants later on, some of these tools. But uh, that, that's my take on it. I think we, we see a lot of uncertainty. And what can we do? We can do as, as good as we can, modernize, dematerialize, um, and not think that there's a trade-off. No, it's not that, oh, I, Either I protect my population in transport workers and, and the port workers, or I open up and move. No, we, we can achieve both with many very specific tools. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, Bill, uh, Bill, if I could um, just uh, add, add something um, on what uh, uh, Jan, Jean, and, and Lars uh, touched on. Um, uh, again, if there is some sort of uh, silver lining to all this, it has kind of served as a catalyst for uh, this trend of digitization in, in the freight industry. Um, and uh, there have been multiple examples of um, during the, the pandemic, um, the introduction of new technologies or the increased use of, of technologies that are out there to kind of, uh, as you said, make it kind of a lower touch um, process and also create some efficiency. So um, Maersk had a good example. They have uh, um, uh, their their online services and their apps. I think there was a, something like a 90% increase in transactions um, on the Maersk platform uh, uh, during the shutdown. Um, uh, Web Cargo is part of the Fritos group. They're a, an air cargo e-booking platform, and they had a, a record number of e-bookings set in, for the month of March, some of them even from Italy and Spain when they were at the height of their, uh, their shutdown. Um, I think uh, Zim uh, introduced an e-booking, uh, an e-bill of lading uh, solution during this. So there, there are many examples uh, as we see, uh, you know, carriers and forwarders looking for solutions during the shutdown. And perhaps the 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 biggest impact hasn't necessarily been the, the the rollout or adoption of technologies, but really the raising of the profile and the raising of awareness in, in the industry that these are really uh, useful tools that will that will serve us well moving forward. Um, you know, moving technology from from uh, a nice to have previously to maybe uh, something we need to uh, as we move forward and, and want to uh, uh, really survive through the next crisis. Um, if Thank I you. can add something real quick, and I just want to toss it over to Jean. Um, you know, in the United States, with the infrastructure as it relates to the need for uh, digitization, we have had pockets like little black holes, if you will. Um, from the Midwest, you know, fi finding the containers, if you will, to go to get from point A to point B. In terms of this digitization that you're trying to put together, um, efficiency helps generate profits. Um, given what you're trying to do, the task at hand, what is your outlook on this? And then overall, from a trucking standpoint, from a rail standpoint, this is something that really is needed across the board. Yeah, Lorianne, I think that's, that's an important point because in the United States, most of our import cargo goes to major metropolitan areas, big cities where consumers like us live and work. Much of our exports move from our rural communities, farmland, manufacturing areas where these big factories are located. So the question is, how can we move those mobile assets, whether they be the containers themselves, the trucks, the rail cars, the engine power and crew to align with where these consumption and production areas are located? In fact, some companies have tried but not done so well just yet in attempting to triangulate the moves of the, some of those assets, including the containers. And this is where an intelligent transportation system network can really help us. As I mentioned very broadly, five imports to every two exports in the nation, 
the balance get empty repositioned back to Asia. Now, there's a lot of nuance and detail that goes into that, but imagine the extrapolation of those numbers to the truck capacity in North America, the rail capacity, again, of engine power, the rail cars themselves positioning the crews at the right location and time with the proper training, and then aligning all of that with our all important vessel schedules that out of a place like Los Angeles will be 40 export vessel sailings per week during relatively normal times. So individual companies have done some pretty good work, including Maersk, on how best to manage their customer base. But the question goes beyond that. And it is not necessarily to bring others who don't do as well up to that leadership position, but I think we could rise all service provisioning companies higher than they may exist today in an effort to bring people together around the reemergence of the American economy. And with that, not only reconnecting U.S. exporting companies to their traditional markets, but attempting to find emerging markets that can help bolster that employment and accelerate the asset velocity of these great service providers that we work with every day. So these are going to be real key aspects and we can put dollar values on those for savings because everyone is looking for that right now, but we can't shrink to greatness. We're going to have to inject incentive monies at the federal, state and local level. Ports like us at, as municipal agencies are also on the ready to invest money, whether it be transactionally or in larger projects to help accelerate that recovery as well. But we've got to work together and there's got to be a little bit of collaboration that goes on into these areas. So we don't A, leave anyone out or B, unintentionally harm part of that supply chain without that good vision and good input from our supply chain experts. Thank you, Jay. So, Ota, do you see this sort of happening in the rest of the world? Is this a, a mainly a US focused response, or is this similar things happening in the EU, in Latin America, Africa, Asia? Yeah, as, as regards the, the overall geography of, of trade, already after the main of the 2008 financial crisis, we saw um, that, um, yeah, the, the trade did no longer grow two to three times faster as the economy. And the, the big question is now, and I think that points a bit in the direction of what, what you and Jean were discussing, the, the who is trading what with whom. Um, and this elasticity that I showed briefly in, in one of my earlier slides, um, the more recent years, trade grew much lower than you would have expected if we had simply extrapolated this correlation between economy and trade. Why is that? That has to do with a growing share of services within the economy. So a lot of what we consume does not require transport of goods. So we consume haircuts and other services. And, um, and the, then the other, the really big question is now whether as a result of this pandemic, and we had discussed this when we were preparing for this webinar, whether there will be more local production, more buying local, making local. Uh, and there are quite a few people who say, yes, we have to buy, we have to produce ourselves. We don't want to depend on whatever needs uh, medical supplies, food from abroad. Look what is happening now. Uh, I think it's more a question of not wanting to depend on a small number of providers. You want to diversify. And this will always include international providers, but national providers. So in that sense, I'm somewhat optimistic that we will continue to trade. I hope so. Uh, it also depends, of course, on the, the trends that were described earlier. Jean mentioned them, uh, the, the, the called trade war, called protectionism, uh, called weakening multilateral system. This, of course, doesn't help. So if today we see a bit, we see less trade as compared to our economic and, and development and consumption, it's difficult to identify. Is it really all due to COVID-19 or is some of this also due to a weakened multilateral system, protectionism and other trends? Very, very difficult. But, but again, the, the main solution should be we, we do what we are doing best, eh? logistics and trade facilitation. 
and then um, yeah, the another the digitalization. I, I brought it up, although I know that uh, the next session of these marine traffic webinars will be specifically on, on digitalization. So I'm looking forward to this one as well. But I think the linkage is very clear. It's uh, the, the containers don't lie. The trade forecast. It also has to do with ensuring that we continue to make trade possible, cheap, efficient, more and more digitalized. Uh, so that these negative trends that we discussed have as little as possible of an impact. I, I do have one thing to add, if I can, with uh, to, to Jan's uh, comments. Uh, when we're looking at COVID-19 and we were uh, talking about uh, the, the trade flows and, and with China, I think with uh, COVID-19, it really just highlights, particularly when it looks at the United States, that China really is uh, the dominant manufacturer of all products. And as we've all heard with the rhetoric from around the world, right, about making things at home. Um, here in the United States, you know, I've, I've had CEOs that can't bristle a broom because they don't have the facilities in place. Um, what I have seen from when I've been speaking with uh, supply chain management officials, that they are talking to uh, companies because they may have moved out of China, but because of COVID-19, the a piece of the overall piece that they might have been making in Vietnam was still made in China. And because of COVID-19, uh, they couldn't get the product out. Or more importantly, from a, person, a personnel standpoint, uh, the, uh, various countries weren't allowed Chinese uh, managers inside their facilities. So what you're now seeing a little bit, it's not a huge trend, but this will actually impact container traffic, is the movement of some companies moving to Mexico. Um, that way, it's a little bit in closer proximity to the United States. Um, and you can rail it in, or you can, you know, you can, you know, you can drive it in via truck. So I think with COVID nineteen, it just really, it just really shows us how small we are in, in terms of globalization, how interconnected we are, and now in terms of where do we go from here? It's just a matter of, uh, you know, planning. But I think we have to come to a harsh reality, at least here in the United States. Not everything is ever going to be made. 100% in the US, it, it just can't, economically it can't. If I can add a comment to uh, to, to what Jan was uh, talking about, uh, because one of the, I mentioned before, one of the, the trends we are seeing from our client base is clearly around the, the digitization and, and making sure we run uh, as much as we can online, etc. But another point that, that speaks to Jan's point is actually what, what I would call redundancy in the supply chain, because we are seeing people uh, basically across our customer base wanting to look for, for more options. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to near shore and, and locally produce everything, but they're certainly looking for having additional options within their supply chains. Some of that will likely be more near shoring. Some of it could also be finding a, a second supplier and then perhaps both of them are still going to be in China. But instead of relying on one, they will be relying on, on two or more. Um, and, and to the point around Mexico, I mean, we are clearly seeing that, that Mexico is becoming a, a stronger and stronger uh, import location from China. So, so perhaps more of the product that, that will be manufactured in, China, in Mexico for the US market will actually lead to an increased number of containers moving from China. It will just move to Mexico rather than into to perhaps to jeans port complex uh, and, and then being uh, used in the manufacturing in Mexico. Yeah, um, and, and, if, and if I could, if I could add something, um, uh, we've seen something similar. So on, on the Fredos uh, marketplace, um, which is a marketplace connecting mostly SMBs uh, with freight forwarders for for multimodal um, uh, e-bookings, um, we've seen something similar. If we look at the the uh, percentage of search, so in other words, uh, SMBs who are looking to to import from uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and we've seen a trend that started with the trade war where, you know, China, as we said, still obviously has, has the lion's share. And I, I think it was as high as uh, 95 or, or, or 96% of searches were for freight out of China. But we've seen that that share um, fall to as low as 89% um, ahead of, of COVID-19. Um, not necessarily that, that bookings aren't coming out of China. As we said, the, the, they're still uh, very dominant, but we've seen at least interest again, from this SMB um, uh, segment uh, of looking to diversify or looking at, at other options. So of course, um, China is still uh, uh, holding that, that biggest share by far. 
And I think this trend, the desire to diversify, which, which makes sense. So we should produce more in Africa and Southeast Asia and so on. On the negative side, there is uh, there it's more difficult to have the economies of scale and to actually have integrated regional uh, in, even in the European Union and uh, build it us in that direction. Even the European Union during the crisis, all of a sudden within Schengen, within EU borders were closed, and that then disrupted even the the regional production and made big countries that don't have internal borders. Uh, although even within the United States, I believe some states made it a bit more difficult to trade with other states, but overall it's one big market. And also China may have locked some Wuhan down for a period, but overall it does not help to have international borders if you want to generate regional value chains and compete. Uh, and there again, it's not just in the ports, it's especially also in transit and border crossings where you don't want the trucks waiting at the border because the transport, the truck drivers are not allowed to cross the border. That's another area where also we work with the customs offices in many African countries to dematerialize their processes so that, that there's an opportunity for some countries to, to participate in this, what we think should happen, this diversification. Thank you. Um, I think we've got for a few questions on the floor. So looking to my right, I can see some of the questions which have popped into to the chat area. I can see we have Richard Ty says, prior to the COVID-19 crisis, shipping, shipping companies were concerned about low sulfur fuel and scrubber fitting. As our ship, ship, shipping companies taking this opportunity to fit as many scrubbers as possible um, once COVID-19 crisis is over, we don't want, so we don't have to worry about low sulfur fuel. Lars, I don't know whether you're able to respond to that briefly. No, but I, well, I, I can at least speak for for the company I represent that uh, that, that yes, we 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 are continuing uh, to to fit scrubbers. Uh, of course, um, also shipyards uh, have been impacted by lockdowns and uh, lack of labor. So so it's not necessarily something that has been able to continue uh, with the same speed that it was uh, before the crisis hit us. But but yes, the, the process to fit scrubbers is, is continuing. Uh, uh, it, it is a bit slower than, than the initial plans, but it's still ongoing. Um, we have a question from Richard Tai. To, this is to Jude Levine. He says, Freytos recently posted reports that air freight rates dropped as much as 60%, um, with we seeing ocean freight rates recovery, picking up. Is this the sign of a recovery? Uh, right, that's a really good question. The, the, the question of whether this is heading towards a recovery or not, um, it's really a difficult one to answer. As we mentioned, there's so much uncertainty. But if we talk about the impact of uh, uh, of the pandemic on different modes, uh, it certainly is a trend. Um, and so so what we saw was uh, air cargo rates really spiking um, from the beginning of the year, really reaching a peak in, in April. They were up about 400% to what they were at the beginning of the year. And that was due to two things. One is uh, the reduction of air cargo capacity because almost half of air cargo normally travels by passenger jet, which are uh, largely removed from the market. And the other was this um, peak demand for, for PPE, as I think um, some of us had mentioned earlier. And those two things combined to have this very high demand for time sensitive goods and not so much capacity to carry them, um, which sent rates uh, really skyrocketing. Um, as the PPE, supply chain has kind of normalized as there's been uh, enough of this uh, uh, crisis mode to build up inventories where inventories need to go, uh, more of it can travel by, um, by ocean. Um, not all of it is needed yesterday. So that's why we're seeing the, that, um, uh, the reduction in rates uh, in terms of air, although it should be, should be said that air rates are still much higher than they would normally be at this time of year. Um, so I think it is a sign of, uh, of a good step towards recovery or that um, the, the way the, the the, the virus itself is being managed um, is improving in a lot of places. Um, whether it's certain, whether it's a definite sign that we're moving or only towards this this rebound and there won't be ups and downs along the way um, is obviously hard to say. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Luka Vucic, Vucic, who says, "Can you give a brief future perspective of alternative routes, maritime routes, this around the Suez, like sailing around the Cape or the Northern Sea route in Q3, Q4?" taking into account lower demand, oil prices, and especially the environmental component of the voyage? It's, it's a good question. Um, we have seen some changing trading patterns, I understand. Perhaps it's something I could 
um, ask Jan to, to answer. Um, well, for, for quite many years, there have been forecast or expectations that the Northern Sea Route and also the Trans-Siberian Railway would uh, gain significant market share vis-a-vis -vis the, the sea route through Suez. Uh, so far, it has not yet happened. And although we have, again, record temperatures and, and there will be less ice, um, the studies we have seen, it, it will still take a long time because ice-free is not like ice-free. There is still, you still need um, SARS, um, uh, search and rescue SAR and um, it's it's not quite ready yet, the Northern Sea Route. I think it will take a long time. And for rail, uh, the alternative route vis-a-vis -vis the container shipping through Suez, again, it's not quite that volume. It has to cross borders. Uh, we have seen now, uh, also especially in times of COVID, where rail was seen as a possible alternative to um, air transport because the passengers were no longer flying, so there was no belly cargo capacity available, so things were put on trains and the trains stood at the border. So yes, it is growing, these alternatives are growing, but I don't see them in order of magnitude to replace what is happening today with the main east-west routes. It's a guesstimate and some years I may be proven wrong, but trying to answer the question. Maybe colleagues from the shipping line would actually be better equipped uh, <laughs> to answer this. I don't know if Lars has an opinion here. Or, no. or Jean, I'm sure Jean must have, must look at the competition. And if, if product, I see a bit of more changed geography of trade interaction, if production moves a bit southwards from China more to Vietnam or Indonesia and so on, then all of a sudden the route through the Panama Canal um, becomes less competitive vis-a-vis -vis the Suez Canal to the US. So these are can have a stronger impact on the volumes for Gene's port than the Northern Sea Route, I, I guess. Yeah, Ian, you're exactly correct. And the it, it follows the investment of the two canals as far as the capabilities here for ports in the United States. Uh, the addition of two-way 24-hour convoys through the Suez Canal make efficiency so much greater than it was even a decade ago when I lived in the Middle East. We look at what the Panama Canal has done with the third lock and that gives economies of scale to larger container ships when liner companies traditionally could only push through 3,500 or 4,000 TEU vessels. Our ports on the east and Gulf Coast of the United States have invested a tremendous amount of money with the support of the federal government to deepen their waters, widen their channels, raise bridges to get these larger ships in. So all of that is fact. And it's what creates velocity with these assets that helps give the return to the liner shipping company, the railroad, the trucking firm, et cetera, worldwide. It's just a little more magnified here in the US with the addition of these capabilities through the two canals. I think the industry will always continue its attempt to innovate, and whether it be the modes of transportation that Jan just mentioned, still the Belt and Road Initiative throughout Asia, the subcontinent and out, is of consideration with a lot of China-backed money going into those emerging economies. So there'll always be something. But 90% of world trade moves on water today. And to affect that type of change, whether it be near or reshoring alternative routes, That'll always be in play for some creative mind to help utilize these methods to start alternatives. And it keeps folks really fine tuning their service effort, minimizing their cost to be as competitive in the marketplace as possible. So that type of competition around routes and locations is something that I think our industry should embrace. So it brings out the finest in what we offer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we've reached the end of our allotted time, pretty much exactly on time. So thank you very much to all our panelists for taking the time and effort to share your expertise with our audience. Thank you to our audience for listening. And thank you very much to Marine Traffic for hosting and organizing this event. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.